Okay, cool. Um, also, at the end of class, I do have a sign in for today. So please do come get credit for having been here today. I'm going to go over, I hope, uh, the first third of this text, books, or excuse me, chapters one through five. If I ever say books, no, this is a convention that I maintain from describing the Odyssey and the Aeneid so many times. Uh, the Odyssey and the Aeneid are sort of artificially transformed uh, or or placed in 24 books. This is almost undoubtedly because of decisions of Roman grammarians splitting uh, the text of the Odyssey and the Iliad into 24 papyrus scrolls. Scrolls were themselves books, books at this time. And so the chapters are called books because they were each independent uh, holders of the story. So when I say books instead of chapters, know that that's because I'm used to doing that when I am in the waters of the time with which I am most all right, we talked a little bit about James Joyce's life, his marriage to Nora Barnacle. We talked a little bit about his bibliography, also about just how difficult this text has been described over time by such luminaries as the analytical psychologist Carl Jung, T.S. Eliot, uh, the always uh, colorful Vladimir Nabokov, and even uh, the very well-known today George Orwell author of Animal Farm in 1984. Have any of you read one or the other of those texts? Well worth your time. It's one of those great classics that you can read in like a day. So you might as well read it sort of like a mice and men and you could decrease your number of great books that you have read. Uh, something perhaps worth doing during some summer. All right, the structure of Ulysses. Many of you will have noticed if you do not have the Gabler edition that there are not chapter markings and there are not chapter names in your edition. I apologize to you for that. So that is why I ask that you get the Gabler edition. James Joyce, after he first published this text, wrote a list of 18 chapters with each which each have a name that is related to Homer's Odyssey. 18 chapters is itself a fairly significant number because as I said, Homer's Odyssey and Iliad are themselves split into 24 and John Milton's Paradise Lost as well as Virgil's Aeneid are split into 12. So it's as if this text is itself halfway between that which is Greek and that which is Latino English, Latinic English. Um, and somebody just close the back door just in case somebody decides to converse right outside of the class as often happens. Thank you very much. All right. When you read each of these chapters, it is essential that you read the chapter of heading. Joyce included these chapter headings post publication in order to help orient you and guide you through this text. Because often, if you do not know the theme of a chapter, it will seem like Picasso's Garnica to you. You all know this, this image that probably maybe helped a little bit. There's that famous bowl that looks so funky on it. And so this is a text of great detail, like Don Quixote first introduces into the sort of modernist ethos. And yet there are connecting Ariadne's threads. Ariadne was the uh, was the uh, the daughter of Minos, who had a golden thread that she gave to Theseus that allowed him to navigate into and then out of the labyrinth. You yourself will need something like this thread, and the title I suggest is part of it. So when you read Telemachus chapter one, know that this text is supposed to, in some way, connect its major character, not yet its protagonist, because it's not clear that this text has a protagonist. Uh, because there are three main characters, not simply one, and the one whom we spend the most amount of time with is introduced second, in the same way as in the Odyssey. Odysseus is introduced to us second, though the tale is named for him. He is the so-called titular character. So Nestor is the second chapter, and there will be, uh, there's a character, Deasy, Mr. Deasy, who runs a school putatively an image of wisdom, and yet we see that this is a bit of an ironic representation because when he cuts his sword or cuts his blade against uh, 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 Stephen, we find that he falls a little bit short. Um, and uh, well, the third chapter, I apologize for this chapter being in this text, chapters three, nine, and 15 are especially monstrous. Nine is itself named for two classical monsters, Scylla and Charybdis. Note how I say those, and they can be difficult to say without having heard them before, like so many literary or uh, terms or terms uh, originally from different languages uh, that, we don't, that we have much less experience with. Um, the final chapter of the second part of 
of Jane Joyce's uh, Ulysses will feature a place called Night Town. It is itself called uh, uh, Circe, and it uh, is about 150 pages of, of stream of consciousness sort of play. Uh, it, it is, to use the language of my people, the Californians, extremely gnarly. Um, and, and in the way that a gnarled tree curves in on itself, it is very hard to follow. It is extremely hard to follow. Do not expect to follow, let it wash over you like, um, like the experience one might feel having had communicant wine for the first time. Um, so today I'm going to attempt to get through, I will certainly get through Telemachus, Nestor, and Proteus. I will uh, strive to introduce us to Leopold Bloom and Molly Bloom and Calypso and Lotus Eaters. And then we will be almost one third of the way through this text. You will have already read through chapter seven. So you have read through the first third of this text. I encourage you very much to continue reading and to certainly make it past uh, the sand trap, which is Proteus um, as, uh, as Santee Mount Strand is walked along by our, our, our main character, who perhaps seems like a protagonist, our Telemachus-like uh, Telemachus -like Stephen Daedalus, and uh, and then also when you uh, this week near the end of it get to skill and courageous, I hope that you may get through these two classical the trait that uh, allows one to get through these two classical monsters. Um, something else to mention is that not only is this text broken into eighteen chapters, it is subdivided into three sections for its three main characters. This is very similar to the Odyssey, um, which itself is split in some ways into three, at least into two. The first four books of the Odyssey feature Telemachus, the son, the now grown son of Odysseus and his, his uh, living situation where the suitors, uh, his mother's, his uh, mother's uh, potential lovers um, are attempting to woo his mother and eating his food, eating him out of the house and home as it were. And then his voyage um, to meet Nestor and then to meet Menelaus where he hears the story about Proteus, the shape-shifting god of the sea. The next uh, several books, books 5 to 14, uh, uh, um, represent the wanderings of Ulysses, where he tells, not only do we see a few of his wanderings, but we hear the vast majority of them in the story that he tells to the Phaeacians and King Alcanoas after the young lady, Nausicaa, who has a bit of a crush on Odysseus, brings her home to her father after washing her clothes in the hopes that a young suitor would show up to her doorstep. Um, and the, the final part, though I haven't often seen the Odyssey split into three, might be when after Odysseus defeats the suitors and then um, gets to re-engage and speak to his wife, Penelope. And they, uh, they tell each other stories of what has happened over the last 20 years for the entire night. And in fact, in a very beautiful moment of poetry, Athena holds back the dawn so that they can have more time to each other. Isn't that a very romantic? Notion, isn't it? Can you imagine saying that to somebody that I wish the gods would hold back the dawn so I might have more time with you? It's beautiful stuff. Um, perhaps not, but yeah, I think so. In this text, to come back to the uh, present, as it were, to Ulysses, Ulysses itself split into three, like a triptych. Uh, you know what a triptych is? It's one of those sort of poster boards, it's a work of art. It has one side, a second side, and a third side. You know, most poster boards that you do science projects on are themselves blank triptychs now. Um, and so this is itself spatially, uh, as well as sort of linearly and chronologically, but not quite chronologically, as you notice, because Stephen and, and Bloom um, both start their days at 8 a.m., and yet we see them in different places at 8 a.m. It's a form of spatial, uh, uh, spatial um, uh, writing, right? writing a text uh, in such a way, I'm forgetting the exact term for it, it's called spatial something, but it's where in the text, the characters are representing and living in the same time separate from each other and doing their own sorts of things. I'll, I'll get that right next time. Sometimes things drop out of the head as well. Uh, so the Telemachia is the first three chapters. It follows Stephen Davis, him waking up, dealing with his roommate, leaving his key at home, going to teach for about an hour and a half from the sounds of it, somewhere between, 8 and 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., not a very long day for him. And then his walk along the beach, uh, where it seems like lots of things happen, and yet most of that which happens happens in his head, except for him seeing a dog living 
uh, which is described as several different animals in his imagination. Um, it seems to be imitating them. See itself a uh, dead dog, actually drowned. And you notice that theme of drowning continues throughout all three of the first chapters. See, Dedalus remembers a man who drowned that, or rather remembers a man who almost drowned that uh, Buck Mulligan saved. There was also a man whose body was only recently found who drowned 12 days ago, who the gases from his body had to raise him up uh, to the, the top of the sea so that he could be found. Lysias that he teaches by John Milton is about a young man who drowned, and uh, and this dog that is on the edge of the surf on the beach seems itself to have drowned. And so he, in sort of a union synchronicity sort of way, continues to return to similar thoughts. And keep in mind, drowning is a form of dying. Dying is something that his mother just did. His mind, regardless of how many ways he tries to escape it by thinking of overly cerebral um, things and even his own transformation from, say, student to teacher to uh, creator of a new consciousness to artist, um, is, it, is doomed to fate. In the same way that the character Leopold Bloom will himself try and engage in escapism from his domestic situation, in which he experiences a psychological distance from his wife that keeps them from physical intimacy from each other, created by the fact that his son Rudy died 10 years ago, and he and his wife cannot overcome the fact that they now no longer feel erotic feelings for each other, will not couple again to create a new child, because when they look at each other, they see their dead son. And particularly, this is a problem with Bloom. It's not that his sexuality has been blunted. We see that. He, he checks out a woman who is stepping into a carriage. He's conducting a sort of pseudo writing affair with Martha Clifford and experiencing weak joy. Very pornographic, I would say, in that way. Weak joy is an abstraction of the relationship in written form. There's not a true corporeal aspect to it, physical aspect to it, or even a real love because he's using a pseudonym, Henry Flower. He is not even being himself. You might think about whether that is always part of something like an affair, that one is playing a role that one is not, uh, that does not, that treats one as an actor rather than as the person one truly is, and whether that might be part of the so-called problem of having an affair, besides the fact that one may be you know, trans, uh, uh, trespassing upon one's own hosts. Um, and also we know that later he will engage in a bit of onanism while looking at a young uh, lame girl. Lame, I mean, not in terms of her not being cool, but in fact, she cannot run because one of her legs is, uh, is damaged um, uh, perpetually. Okay, so um, the third part of this text, the nostos, um, which comes from an excellent Greek word. Which do, you know, do you know, is there an English word that comes to mind that involves this word nostos that we can think of? Anybody feeling homesick? right now or ever feel homesick and think of a slightly more expensive word that might mean the same thing. Nostalgia, yes. Uh, nostos means homecoming. Algos means pain. It's like a home pain to be nostalgic. So the nostos is a return home. And something that uh, we, uh, we thinking types often like to do to problematize this notion is to ask the question, can one ever go home? When Odysseus returns home 20 years after having left for Troy and started his 10-year-long version back home, many people don't know this, that, but he spends 10 years at Troy and then 10 years getting home. So he's not for 20 years, not just 10 years. When he leaves, his son is an infant. When he returns, his son is a man. When he leaves, his house is in order. When he comes back, in shambles. When he leaves, his wife is faithful. He comes back. Maybe, maybe not. Is he returning to the place that he remembers at all? In Ulysses, Leopold Bloom will leave his home after making breakfast for his wife and having a very short literary conversation with her. She will ask him, what is metempsychosis? So part of the basis for this course. So Thomas mom will bring it up too. And he said, oh, it's the transmigration of the soul. That's like answering, you know, giving a definition of a word with a more difficult word to understand. If you don't know metempsychosis, transmigration, just a sub Latin in basis uh, and root, uh, is pretty difficult too. He says, well, 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 he has to change what he says, uh, make it slightly simpler. Or she is not particularly literary. She reads romance novels. And you, you see here, 
a clue to their relationship. In the same way that Bloom looks at, gawks at ladies in a voyeuristic way and keeps on an abstracted relationship in writing with a woman, his wife reads romance novels. Why might she read romance novels without physical intimacy with her husband? What is it that she is obviously seeking this, which Bloom is obviously seeking and yet only gets in a uh, partial uh, degenerate form? I don't say degenerate morally, but I mean just not in the form that one would most like to have. Obviously, the relationship between the two would be uh, what they would ideally have. But what is it that she seems to be missing? Why would one read a romance novel as a married person? What do romance novels entail? And I don't mean a Shabbat romance. I mean in our contemporary sense of romance. Yes? Like love and affection and 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 all that goes along with it, right? It's in like an adventure and it shows a connection to somebody with whom one feels powerful feeling. It makes someone feel alive and connected. Again, at least weekly or daily. She seems to suffer from the same psychological distance from him as Penelope and Odysseus suffer from the physical distance from each other. And so the Nostos, chapter 16 to 18, will feature a homecoming. Like, will it be home for Bloom? Because we know at 4 p.m., 4 p.m. this very day, she will meet her extremely dapper, straw hat wearing, thistle in his teeth, having great leather shoes wearing, man, it blazes boiling. And you can hear it all in the name, can't you? And even in Lily's letter, she is herself starting to make a blaze that's almost called boiling. She's called herself in the mind of Bloom, a pale reflection of her own mother. And uh, yeah, you know, one strives to be the opposite as a, as a child, right? Uh, or as the child of something, um, to be uh, not just a pale reflection, um, like Ias's son uh, was wished for him to stop playing and play, but to be something more, to add uh, to like Telemachus, uh, or like, or excuse me, like Stephen Davis as a figure of Telemachus to transcend the boundaries of one's parent, to do something new, to add something uh, unique, not just to weakly imitate that which came before. In fact, in literature, this is how we sort of damn um, works that we consider not very good. We call them derivative. Not mathematically speaking, but if you know, if you think of the function of a derivative, this will uh, help to explain this notion. What does it mean for a work to be dismissed as being called derivative? Yes. It's unoriginal. It's just another, just another part of the same. It's the seventh cigarette in a pack, you might say. It's just there's nothing unique about it. Uh, that's not an actual expression. It's just an expression that I used because I don't often. I'm not just derivative as it. All right. Okay. So I would like to now talk about the first five chapters of this text, if I can get through this in about 15 minutes so that our presenters have the time to do that which they can. My model for going through this text will be um, often to share a quote from it, often the very first quote in the text. I'll particularly do this during Bloom's Odysseic chapters, but to tell you, uh, to give you some background on the Odyssey, to help explain the connection between the name of the chapter and what's happening after. And I, I would like very much for you to give me some feedback at some point to let me know whether that's helpful because there are many um, plans of attack that one can take with this text and there are many, just as many ineffective plans of attack as well. Chapter one, not book one, Telemachus and the Black Mass. Do you know what Black Mass is, by the way? Black Mass is mass that attempts to be Catholic or Christian in origin but then in some way heretically, um, uh, it changes the details to spoil the sacredness of it. So it'd be like, uh, I mean, something that could be a black mass would be like using, or part of a black mass would be like using corrupted holy water, using unsanctified wine, using bread that is not of the host, something like that. And I'll explain how this one works too. But first, this chapter is called Telemachus. Who's Telemachus? Telemachus is the 20 year old son of Odysseus, who's grown up without a father. He hangs around his house in Ithaca, living in his own mind, watching Penelope's suitors, who are near his own age, 
by the way, and are themselves not warriors, because they never went to war at Troy, eat his food, sleep with the serving women. It's something like 9 to 11 or 50 of them that come to death at the end. Athena then visits him in the form of Mentes, says, you should go visit this guy Nestor in Pylos, same being Pylos, and then you should go visit Menelaus. So they may have information on your father. Um, Telemachus has spent 20 years with this, like so many other people, that his father is dead, and yet they don't have the body. And like so many POWs from Vietnam, he lives in limbo. His father's probably dead. It's been so long, can he move on without sure knowledge that his father is dead? Not really. He's, it's like when you have a piece of skin that's still connected, but needs to come off. You are yourself in a limbic state or a liminal state. You, you are almost whole or almost part. You're somewhere in between. You're like a Mobius strip, which is itself somewhere between the first and the second dimension. That's the infinity sign. By the way, it's sometimes mimicked by uh, 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 nausea-inducing roller coasters. But so the beginning of the Odyssey has nothing or does not feature Odysseus, except in that sense, he is on the mind of everybody. And he is physically not present in the same way that our Odysseus here, uh, our Bloom, is not yet physically present, though temporally he is doing his own thing. Um, all right, so the text starts in Martello Tower. On the seashore near Dublin, there's an actual place, like so many of the places in this text. Um, and was first founded, I think, uh, to, uh, to stem an invasion by a foreign force. Um, he, uh, our, our Stephen Daedalus, has breakfast with Buck Mulligan, um, the boisterous medical student who once saved a drowned man, usurping the literary um, ambitions of, of Stephen Daedalus by going out and getting him drunk on a fairly regular basis. Kind of hard to write this new epic literature if all you're ever doing is swimming, is having your wits swim in booze. And yet, this is a division that our young protagonist, our main character, one of our main characters, finds himself in. He is young. He wants to engage in camaraderie with his friends. And yet, he is responsible for writing a text that represents the soul of his people. So he is going to have to grow up at some point. Um, like our Telemachus, who himself must grow up in order to stand against those who would take what is his and are in fact already doing so. So they have breakfast, something to notice that Stephen doesn't actually eat all day until he meets Bloom and tells him that he hasn't eaten. This, uh, this, makes, uh, this makes Bloom's jaw drop. He sees a very, he loves to eat. And he's just like, you're not haven't eaten anything? It's crazy. Um, and the first thing, in fact, we see him doing is preparing food. Um, uh, Bloom, not Stephen. Stephen will have, will drink, he'll get his calories by drinking, he'll, he'll smoke, and, and that's mostly what he'll do is sort of an intellectual. So it's a pretty good representation. Uh, on this. The chapter ends, well, and also there is Milkmaid who is met, whom Haynes, the Englishman, speaks in Irish too. She doesn't know Irish. He is himself a figure of the colonizing of England that now owns Ireland and they are unified and has imposed their English language on the Irish culture. Um, uh, and this Haynes seems to want to collect the sayings of this Irishman Daedalus and to also collect the language of the Irish in order to subject it, to make it a subject of study. Um, I, I said orientalized last time. Orientalized usually means to look at Eastern elements in something. Orient in Latin means East, Occident means West. I might have said better exoticized. Um, to, to look at the Irish people as stereotypical symbols of themselves. Like if you're like, okay, well, let's get some poorly clovers, grain, and Irish whiskey, this is what they are. That's, uh, that is itself sort of a, a, a stereotypical representation of a people rather than an accurate representation. You may have heard that, for example, Chicago does a much bigger St. Patrick's Day than, say, Ireland, and turns their big river green, um, which, well, go to Ireland one day and say, test that for yourselves. In any case, the text starts with what I described as the Black Mass, and it is called, and I call it the Black Mass because Buck Mulligan uses the traditional Latin words to start a mass. In Troibo, ad altare day, it means I come to, or I will come to, future first person, indicative, uh, singular, I will come to the altar of God, he says. 
with his cracked mirror and his shaving cloud. He's not himself a priest. Uh, this is itself a bit of uh, casual heresy by this man. Know that he's a medical student. Know, remember that he once saved a man. Know that he, he's sort of like what you would imagine, what most people would consider a young, successful individual. It's funny, it's charismatic. He saved somebody once and he's going to med school. Seems like a real winner. Then you look at Stephen, skinny, not very attractive, teacher, not a Jesuit, thinks he's some sort of poet, hasn't written much, moody, uh, sort of says things that most people don't understand particularly well, just doesn't seem like a champ, as it were. And yet, in his heart of hearts, Stephen will measure himself against Buck Mulligan and often find Buck wanting and find the judgment of those who think Buck is the real star wanting as well, which I think should give you all a bit of hope. It is not always the judgment of those around you that is most uh, accurate on the weight on the weight or value of one's uh, one's inner substance, or that which is one's capable. Um, and we've probably heard many instances of, of great artists who were denigrated by their teachers and yet became great despite their, uh, their teachers. And, well, I encourage you to keep that close to your heart. Haynes, the Englishman, as I said, wants to collect Stephen Saints, has terrible nightmares at night to keep Stephen up. Very interesting to sort of psychoanalyze why that might be, and speaks fluent Irish. Stephen Davis is called Kinch by Buck Mulligan. His mother died the year before. Remember, he was called back from Paris work he went to after finishing his studies. In order to sit at her needle side, he sings to her, Here comes Fergus, a beautiful Irish folk song, but he refuses to pray over her because he is atheist. He is not Catholic, though he has had a profound Catholic education, and all of that Catholic dogma and thinking remains in his mind. He thinks in terms of it, he cannot escape it. And this is part of why history, besides his own personal history with his mother dying, is a nightmare from which he wishes to wake up. Hmm. Remember that he was the gifted protagonist from a portrait of the artist the young man. So this is the second text in which he is, is writing this figure for himself. And he is trying to give voice to the soul of Ireland when he is not teaching, hanging out with Buck, or getting drunk. Uh, the second and the third of the uh, items on that list are often one and the same. Uh, the nature of the Irish might be represented by Buck in one respect or another. In the oppressive English, might be represented by Haynes, almost, uh, more, I think more clearly so. In the weight of the past, by the milkmaid, all oppressed. Uh, all oppressed, you know, it's interesting, it's the mundane moment. It's just breakfast, it's just breakfast. And yet, breakfast is something that happens every day. And so, can one feel oppressed in some transcendental and crushing way, even in a very mundane situation? Could, wouldn't it be the case if one really thought about it that it's more likely that one is going to be oppressed in mundane situations than in dynamic and unique ones, given what one spends one's day doing most of the time? Aren't we usually doing mundane things? Driving to school, combing our hair, brushing our teeth, eating our three to seven or eight meals a day, depending. Um, and don't we spend most of our time our time doing things that we ought to do. And so when would the special things happen? During the mundane and regular and every day, or only during a uh, unique sort of special times, or perhaps every day is unique and special. And we only think of days as common uh, in relation to each other. I don't know. Chapter two is called Nestor. Nestor is the wisest and oldest Achaean who fights at Troy in Homer's Iliad. He is one of the individuals to whom uh, is sent by the goddess of wisdom, Athena, in the Odyssey. He is a figure of wisdom. He is profoundly wise. He is treated as the wisest, not ironically, in, in the Iliad. Even wiser than Odysseus, who is treated as the most fluent speaker. He is perhaps the most intelligent, but not the wisest. There seems to be some distinction maintained here. And age seems to be part of wisdom, at least in this ancient, archaic, great perspective. Nestor is described as a horseman and the Gorinian horseman. And he loses his son in Tilichus and battles with someone who knows loss. And perhaps that's part of his wisdom. To move now to, um, to Ulysses, Stephen Daedalus is teaching a half day at a private school in Dalton. Um, Stephen thinks about this 
uh, some funny thought that he has as a teacher that uh, the parents of his students will want to get their money's worth from his education. Interesting. The contrast the teacher has to deal with to be something of a salesman to provide a product, but also to provide something that is non tangible that it's worth more than he does. And yet, one often pays for one's education. So that's a very strange thing to uh, think about. It's like putting value on art, for example. What is the price of art and what makes it valuable? Well, there are many different values. A student of his, a student that is described as being very much not promising by the book saying sums, must stay after and stay after why? Because he didn't get it. Uh, he didn't understand his algebra. And, uh, and because of his lack of gifts, Stephen thinks about himself. Thinks, well, this, this young boy must be loved by his mother. Even he is loved. By his mother. And then Stephen thinks of him, of course, his own self, his own lack of looks, and his own mother, and her, the nature of his love, her love for him. And so again, the thought of his mother presses him, even when he's working, dealing with young people has, that have, in some ways, nothing to do with his own family situation. He returns back to that which haunts him, his mother, the one who has brimstone on her, her or ashes, excuse me, on her her breath, um, sort of uh, opposite from Hamlet, who sees his father, um, the spirit of his father dead, it is uh, Stephen Davis' mother that he sees in ghostly form over and over again, and uh, we'll especially see her when he gets drunk later. Um, not necessarily the best way to get away from all his problems, in fact, maybe a way to invite his problems. So I mean, uh, and, and so, Mr. Deasy, uh, uh, Cyril Sargent is then led out to field hockey, uh, among the other young people, and Stephen Davis has a chance to talk to the figure of Nestor, Mr. Deeds, who is himself an apologist for Irish, um, um, Irish unification with the English. So he is on the opposite side from Stephen. Stephen would want Ireland to be independent. Mr. Deasy, like many of the colonists in America in the middle, late 18th century, is just to say unified with the English. So they find themselves politically divided and he has something of a political argument that gets history a little bit wrong um, with Stephen and ends up saying, oh, I like to cut my sword against you. And yet we find that uh, he did not come out, he did not get the better of Stephen, but much got very much the worse and yet he's not intelligent enough to recognize that. And I, which I, perhaps you have noticed in your own intellectual debates that it's very often not the case that one knows when one has been accused. It's like the knights from uh, um, uh, uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, who's had his arm cut off and his other arm. Tis but a flesh wound. He says, I've, I've, I've been through worse. And the knight, he's, he's fighting against says, no, you haven't. Because obviously, if one's arms have just been cut off, he's never been through a worse uh, being than that. Then yet, well, uh, uh, it is hard to see the worst of human so life. Much harder than that was physical. In any case, um, this is where Stephen mentions almost casually that history is a nightmare from which he wants to wake up. Keep in mind that this is his personal history with his mother and also the history of the Irish people and their subjection to the English, but also his own subjection as an atheist to the Catholic faith. He is, he is constantly feeling his fate usurped and himself suppressed by the weight of history, and it is history itself that keeps him from becoming this new voice for Ireland, and in fact, you might consider his own position as teacher, an ironic one, teacher of history, right? What worse job exists for escaping from the weight of history than to teach history? And you might even consider that to be a teacher is itself to be antithetical to the artist, because a teacher presents that which has already happened, that which has, to some extent, already become conventional to those who come, uh, who are coming next, the young, um, whereas the artist creates something in some way totally new, does not simply uh, present, as I said earlier, the seventh cigarette in the pack, the derivative knowledge that all know who have come before the young. Um, and so, <clears throat> chapter three, Proteus. I apologize for the fact that chapters three, nine, and 15 exist in this text, and yet this is part of getting through the text, it's wading through the sand. He's called Proteus. Proteus is a very interesting god in the Odyssey and in mythology as a whole. He's a sea god, not the sea god. There are many sea gods. Nereus, father of the Nereids, one of the queen is Thetis, the mother of the Pope. Um, 
course, there's Poseidon. Of course, there's Oceanos from, you know, it was the primordial ocean that surrounds the world from whom we get the word ocean. Proteus is a transforming, mutating god, a god that is known to tell the truth if only he be caught. And yet, since he can transform into many forms, it's very difficult to grasp him. And so, if he is caught, which he is by Menelaus, and as told by Menelaus in Book Four of the Odyssey, he will tell the truth, but a bitter, bitter truth. Truths, and the truths that he tells to Menelaus are twofold. One is that his brother is dead, and there is nothing he can do about it. His brother, who fought and who 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 brought together the army that fought for Menelaus' stolen wife at Troy for ten years, somebody who is very much important to Menelaus and one of his best friends, Odysseus, is trapped on an island with nymph who will not let him go, and there is nothing that he can do. So you might look at this if you wish to see this pessimistically as the sort of wisdom that one acquires as one ages, that humbles one, that regardless of what one accomplishes, there are many things that one cannot do. There are many people that one loves that one cannot help, and that to become, to age and become wise and to know the truth of one's existence is to know just how impotent one truly is. And this is a pessimist way to read Proteus. How does this relate? To Stephen Daedalus taking a walk on the beach. Well, think of the beach and remember it particularly in its Faustian, uh, in its Faustian guise. What is it that Faust does with the water and the land? He claims the land from the water. He transforms it. The beach is itself a place of transformation, where the water meets liminally uh, the land and transforms from water to land. He also ups the nature of sand. Does sand itself have a form, or is it just a particulate substance that is often and temporar temporarily given as, say, a sand castle? Don't, don't we often look at sand castles as temporary uh, representations of that which fades so quickly away? It's almost like a sand castle is a representation of a war, right? We occupy this eternal form for just a brief moment in time, just have the wind blow us away. In fact, there's a Tibetan correlate to this. The Tibetan, um, the Tibetan monks, the uh, the so-called lamas, they uh, you may have seen this before. They make these beautiful mandalas. Mandala means circle in Sanskrit that are very ornate and made of many, many different um, colored. Uh, 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 it's colored dust or sand, but they use these little metal like siphons to just very slowly create these very extremely ornate, uh, beautiful works of art. And then you know what they do when they're finished? That's right. They just wipe them away. I mean, do, do you? How many of you feel pain when you hear about it? You should see it. See it happen sometime. There nowadays we have video of them and going through it and you watch it and you see this and you're like, oh, it's terrible. And well, uh, perhaps this is both the fate of all art and the key as well. So for something beautiful to come to you just to someday pass away. And perhaps this is the one we'll say we ourselves find ourselves. And so Stephen is walking alone. He's worked his day, his hour, as a teacher and been exiled from his home by now he's on a walk. How does this correlate with Proteus, the transforming god? Okay, I'm running out of time. Well, I suggest that what he is doing is transforming the world over and over again in his head, in his imagination. He is thinking of his own father imitating the um, mentally disabled son of his aunt. And in fact, he, he does a sort of stuttering um, uh, uh, imitation in his mind, sort of offensive thing that might still be done by school children today. And all of that might have seemed like something that was actually happening to you as you read. And yet it is two layers removed from the narrative itself. Not only is Stephen walking, he is thinking. And while he thinks, he imagines a situation instead where he is not present where his father is making fun of his aunt and the, the fact that Stephen is spending time there. Very difficult to keep straight. And yet, it seems as if Proteus here is being correlated with the mind of Stephen, that which transforms and is transforming. Well, I think that's all we have time for today because we have something next to get to.